Which is best? The one you like the best. Dry suits also have seals at the neck and wrists. Seals may be made of latex rubber like these. Or neoprene like these. Latex seals are the easiest to put on and take off, to adjust size and to replace if necessary. But they're also the easiest to damage, and they don't insulate and cause cold spots unless there's insulation over or under them. You can get two types of neoprene seals, flat sealing, which are the simplest to put on, and fold under, which are commonly used as neck seals, but also available for wrist seals. Neoprene seals may last longer than latex seals and they insulate, but replacing them is harder and size adjustment takes longer. They also stretch with use, whereas high quality latex seals don't. Again, the best for you is the type you like best. Some dry suits have interchangeable seals, though these are most commonly used in rental dry suits. Keep in mind that seals can leak when you make a fist forming channels under a seal, when there's dirt or hair under a seal, or if you vent air through a seal. But you can usually avoid this leakage through proper donning and diving techniques. A damaged seal may leak quite a bit, and hair under your neck seal will drizzle cold water down your back throughout a dive. When you buy your dry suit, you'll get neoprene seals sized approximately to your neck and wrists, but you may need to adjust them so they're snug, but not uncomfortable. It's best to have seals adjusted by someone trained and experienced in it, but it's not difficult if you're careful. Latex seals are usually tapered so that you can make them larger by trimming them. Have someone hold the seal where you trim off no more than about five millimeters, a quarter of an inch. If in doubt, under trim. You can always retrim if it's still too tight after a dive. But if you cut off too much, you'll have to replace the seal. You don't trim neoprene seals, but stretch them overnight on something that's round and about the right size. Again, air slightly tight if in doubt, and leave room for the seal to stretch further with use. Stretch seals too big, and you'll have to replace them. But never wear a neck seal that's uncomfortably tight because it can trigger the carotid sinus reflex. This is when the seal presses on the carotid arteries in the neck, which the body mistakes for high blood pressure. In response, the heartbeat slows and less blood reaches the brain, but the pressure is still there so the heart slows further. Eventually, a diver can faint because of inadequate blood reaching the brain. A seal tight enough to cause carotid sinus reflex will usually be uncomfortable and make the diver feel lightheaded before losing consciousness. So you can avoid this problem by not diving with an uncomfortably tight neck seal. A dry suit surrounds you with an airspace that you need to equalize when you descend. That's what the inflator valve does. It works like your BCD inflator to add air or argon to your suit to prevent a squeeze and to maintain your buoyancy. The inflator valve connects to your regulator, or if you're using argon to a small tank with a special regulator. The inflator is usually in the center of the chest, but you can have it located elsewhere if you prefer. Remember to disconnect the low pressure hose before taking your scuba unit off and to connect it after you put it on. When you ascend, you need to release expanding gas from your dry suit to prevent excess buoyancy. You do this by pressing on the dry suit exhaust valve while raising it, which usually means ascending with your feet down and raising your left shoulder slightly. You can set the exhaust valves on most modern dry suits to vent automatically. You adjust the valve to hold the amount of gas you want in the suit. We'll go over this in detail when we look at dry suit diving techniques. When you ascend, you set the valve all the way open so the maximum expanding gas escapes automatically. Of course, you can vent manually at any time just by pressing on the valve. You can choose from a lot of different materials in a dry suit. Trilaminate material is one of the more expensive materials, but it's lightweight for travel easy to repair and lasts a long time. 
Coated fabric suits have most of the same advantages as trilaminate, and some types are less expensive. But the lower cost types don't last as long, so may actually be more expensive in the long run. Vulcanized rubber suits are some of the toughest, which makes them popular with commercial divers. They're easy to repair, but they're the heaviest. Like trilaminate, they cost a bit more than other types, but they last long enough to be a good buy in the long run. Crushed neoprene is wetsuit material intentionally crushed to eliminate its buoyancy or insulation. It's very comfortable, durable, and long-lasting, making them popular with wreck divers. They're easy to repair, but you have to dry them first, which can take a while. And like a wetsuit, you can get a bit of evaporative cooling out of water. They cost about the same as trilaminate, but are one of the longest lasting suits. The first modern dry suits were made of wetsuit neoprene like this. Unlike all the other types, neoprene dry suits require no undergarment for warmth unless you dive deep. They're comfortable and moderately priced and easy to repair like crushed neoprene. The primary drawbacks are that they lose insulation with depth and over time, just like a wetsuit, you have evaporative cooling out of water and they require the most weight. Obviously, the best dry suit material is a compromise of characteristics and economics. That's why you might want to choose a composite suit which uses two materials. This suit uses crushed neoprene from the waist down for maximum comfort while swimming and durability in the high wear leg area. Above the waist, trilaminate makes the suit lighter and more compact for traveling. In addition to the dry suit itself, you need to keep your head, hands and feet warm. For your head, you'll use one of a variety of hoods. For many dry suits, you use a wetsuit hood without a bib. Other dry suits provide a warm neck collar to hold a hood bib over a latex neck seal. Latex hoods are usually dry hoods attached to the suit, though there's a neck seal too in case the hood leaks. Latex hoods require an undergarment skull cap for insulation. Virtually all quality dry suits made today have built-in boots, but you can choose from degrees of ruggedness ranging from standard boots to heavy-duty hard sole types. In recreational diving, the usual practice is to use wetsuit gloves with your dry suit. In colder water, three-finger mitts give you the most warmth. In moderately cool water, standard five-finger gloves offer some dexterity. And in water above 12 degrees Celsius, 54 degrees Fahrenheit, some divers cut the fingertips off for more dexterity at the sacrifice of some warmth and hand protection. You tend to be hard on the knees, so knee pads help protect the suit. You can get similar pads for the elbows, buttocks, or other areas. Utility pockets on the thigh come in handy, though add some drag, and many divers like a knife pocket. Suspenders hold the suit uniformly and prevent sagging at the waist, with the side advantage of holding the suit up when you're wearing it between dives. Telescoping torsos provide extra suit length for getting into a self-donning suit. The extra length folds back over itself once you have it on and gives you some adjustability in the suit's fit. Most significantly, it accordions in and out when you bend at the waist or raise your arms, giving you more room to move without making the suit baggy. This is especially useful with materials that don't stretch, like trilaminate.